Welcome to episode eight of the Private Property Podcast. I'm your host, Zamantungwa Kumalo. I hope you've all been staying at home and staying safe during this lockdown. We are on day 25 of the national lockdown. Now this evening, if you are a prospective new home buyer and perhaps you're looking to find out what are some of the things that you need to be looking out for, then this episode is for you. We'll be talking about some of the, mis- some of the most common mistakes that home buyers make and how you can avoid them. And joining me this evening is Grant Smear, who's the director at Epic South Africa. Good evening, Grant. Thank you so much for joining me this evening. Evening. Thanks for having me. Now, a lot of people are probably considering going into home ownership. Uh, Perhaps they're renting or they're staying at home. But as you all know, there are probably some mistakes that a lot of us who buy our homes for the first time make. I know I made a few mistakes early on in my journey. I'd like us to know, have a, a, to have a snapshot of some of the most common mistakes that you've seen out there on the market and help our viewers at home navigate how they can best resolve some of them or avoid some of them. Uh, what would you say are some of the most common mistakes that you've seen, Grant? So I think the most common mistake for a first time buyer is assuming that um, your first home is, is a home that you need to sort of uh, invest yourself in emotionally and it's gonna be a property for the long term. Um, I think that people need to take a, a much better view of your first time home as your first property investment and uh, look at it from that point of view that you might live in for a, a period of time, but could be your first entry to or the starting point for your property portfolio. So to start looking at it as a property investment rather than, than a home for the long term. And how do you look at it differently? I mean, so some people are probably thinking, okay, I, I get that. Uh, maybe I don't want to make an emotional decision. And so many of us make emotional decisions when it comes to property because it, it can be a bit emotional. But how do you almost differentiate or look at it from a different perspective and not just uh, go in with your emotions? Yes, so there's two things. Um, the first thing is to, to take your time. Um, don't rush into something because emotion makes you make, uh, get you to make the wrong decision um, sort of clouds you or, or give you a uh, rose tinted glasses when you're looking at something. So falling in love with property and getting emotional about it, if you take your time, you can really take a step back, look at a property, assess the property correctly, um, even run the numbers. Um, and when I say run the numbers, you want to look at the potential rental opportunity that's created by the property, what sort of return you're going to get, what the expenses are going to be on that property, and whether there's going to be some cash flow if you decide in the future to rent it out. Part two to that is also look at the neighborhood or the area. Um, because you want to make sure that that area is uh, uh, in the stage of the property cycle that is going to be positive rather than uh, being negative. And when I say that, I meaning that there's going to be too much uh, supply in the, in the market. So when you do try and rent it out, you might not get the best rental. Now, you know, Grant, I know one of the other mistakes that we, we tend to make is not shopping around for the best interest rates. If you could tell yeah. us a little bit about that one. Yeah, so I mean, um, you know, traditionally what people do is they go directly to their own bank and they just assume their own bank is going to give them the best interest rate and then they um, accept whatever is offered to them. So, so my suggestion is there's, there's a really good mortgage originators out there that you can approach. They will approach uh, all the banks for you um, and find really the best deal on the market at the moment for your credit profile. So it's very specific to you personally, your credit profile, how you've looked after your accounts, how you've looked after your credit profile. And the banks will um, are at different stages of funding. So, for example, your bank uh, might be in a, in a space where they don't have as much funding available. If if the mortgage rate originates goes to another bank, they may be able to offer you a much better interest rate just because of where they are in their funding cycle. So, it's important that you do shop around. Um, my suggestion is just go to one of the mortgage originators. There are a few very good ones out there. Um, that, again, that approach all the banks for you at the same time. I mean, for our viewers at home, you'd remember we actually covered this on episode seven of the Private Property Podcast, the importance of you know, shopping around uh, and using a bond originator to help you shop around and the different ways that they essentially help you by going to the different banks and even negotiating a better interest rate for you. So if you haven't uh, watched it yet, do go back to episode seven and have a listen to you know, some of the tips that we've, we, we heard from our bond originator, uh, we had a guest from Better Bond who was helping us best navigate how you can um, you know, make the right decisions when you use uh, the bond originator. And of course, if you have any questions for us this evening, you can send them through right here on Facebook and we'll be sure to address them. So if you've already made that mistake or you're already thinking maybe this might be a mistake, send it through and we can help you, you know, work around it uh, and perhaps find a solution for you. 
Now, of course, another, um, an, an, another mistake, Grant, that people make is buying more than what they can afford. Now, we all know that, of course, when you get um, you know, qualified uh, or the maximum amount that you can, you, that the bank will essentially extend to you is based on your gross pay. So it's typically 30% and it's your gross pay. But sometimes people don't actually sit down and do a balance sheet and actually get a sense of what can they really afford. So even if you qualify for a million rands, can you actually afford to service that million rand bond? Can you take us through the importance of almost psychologically understanding the difference between what you can be pre-qualified for and how even though you could be pre-qualified for that amount, it's actually quite possible that you might not be able to afford it. Yeah, so I think again, we've got to, uh, got to uh, tell people to take their time when they're going into the process of, of buying a home and really sit down and look at the numbers. You know, if the bank comes back and says you can afford a million rand, that's fantastic. But you need to know what that actual cost is going to be on a monthly basis. Um, you know, a million rand bond at the moment is probably going to cost you just short of 10,000 rand a month. Um, and even if you're earning 30,000 rand a month gross, you need to look at your other expenses because those expenses might be eating away at your ability to afford that 10,000 rand. Adding to that, you've also got to account for other costs of ownership. You know, there's maintenance costs, there's rates and taxes, there's levies. Um, if you're in a sectional title or homeowners association, which you don't necessarily, uh, or, or which you don't account for when you're renting. So those costs don't exist when you're renting and when you move into an ownership space, the cost of ownership adds up quite quickly. So, you know, the average levy out there is 1,000, 1,200, 1,300 a month. So immediately that's adding 13% to a 10,000 rand bond. So uh, again, you've got to assess all the expenses, not just the bond itself, to understand the, the cost of ownership. And I actually want us to, to, to talk a little bit about that because I, I had it as one of the most common, common mistakes that first home buyers make, that idea of not uh, factoring in the true cost of home ownership. So you often think it's just going to be a bond payment um, and that's the only thing that you essentially have to service. But there's so many other added costs that you typically wouldn't think about or wouldn't know of um, when you're renting. And I've already mentioned some of them. So levies are one. And so even when you're shopping and suppose you're shopping in a sectional title, asking you know how much are levies because some people will find that you know you go in and you probably bought a place and levies are easily 3.5 and if your bond payment is six thousand then that's quite a significant amount you know relative to your bond payment of course now what are some of those costs um of home ownership that people probably wouldn't think about when they are renting because of course that's a different cost altogether a different consideration uh, versus when you finally actually buy your home and have to start uh, not just servicing the home loan, but also, um, you know, keeping up with the upkeep of the actual place. Yes, I mean, um, immediately, if, you, if you're looking at a, a freestanding home, you're going to talk about mostly maintenance. When you're a sexual type of scheme, a lot of the, the external maintenance is in communal areas and it's covered by the body corporate, which comes out of your levy. So, so let's, uh, if you talk about a freestanding home, you're talking about um, maintenance on the, on the outside and then, and then on the inside if you're owning a property. Um, rates and taxes um, from the municipality, so your costs there, your refuse, um, water, uh, which may or may not be included in your rental uh, if you're renting a sectional title, and then your levies is the big one. And there's two parts to the levies as well. There's the ongoing levy, which is the budgeted amount on a, on a monthly basis due, uh, according to the annual budget determined by the body corporate at the AGM. And the second part is the potential of a, a special levy, which is to pay for um, uh, painting of a, of a complex or any major works that a complex needs, or even topping up of the maintenance reserve, which due to the type of management schemes, you need to keep uh, a reserve in place and you might, your, your complex might not have the money so that you need to top it up. So you also might have a special levy. So there's a few things. When you move into sectional title particularly, you need to dig into the finances a lot speak to the owners and um, take a look at the minutes of the AGM because those will be indicators of um, the potential of a special levy coming up. And special levies can, be, can cost a fortune, you know. If you're painting a, a, a complex in, a, in a, a relatively large complex, I mean, uh, painting costs of two, three, four million rand. So you've got to share, share in that cost with one of the owners. And, and I think it's probably one of those things that you don't um, think about. I, I, I recently had to get um, a quote for a paint job for actually two different paint quotes. One was for, for a complex, which cost an arm and a leg. Uh, I mean, it was in the hundred, hundreds of thousands. And, and a part of me was, I was thoroughly shocked about just how expensive uh, you know, painting, and, and it's not even a large complex, but how 
how expensive painting can be. And then another paint um, job was for one of the properties. And even that was actually quite pricey. So oftentimes when you're renting, you probably don't think about that. It might just be perhaps one wall you want to change the color of, or may, and that's if your landlord, of course, allows you to. But the moment you're an owner, you have to think of every little thing. And of course, one of the other costs that we, we actually didn't mention there, Grant, is insurance. So if you're yeah. oftentimes when you're, you know, in a standalone, you might pay for additional insurance because it won't be covered by the body corporate um, or the amount that you pay to the body corporate. So that's an additional cost that somebody probably didn't actually think about as they were thinking about, you know, the, the true cost of home ownership. Um, and of course, then, then there's the one big one. And I've, I'm going to confess, I've actually made this mistake. And it's not having the property inspected before you actually buy the property. Uh, if you can take us through that one. Yeah, so, um, you know, generally you go and view a property and there's an expectation that there's a full disclosure from the seller and there's a requirement that the, the seller does provide a full disclosure. However, th th that requirement only relates to what they could have reasonably have expected to have known in, in relation to the property. So, for example, if you're buying a property that was rented out for many years, that owner could never know all the issues or underlying uh, problems um, that are, are in that property. So you do want to uh, consider having a professional um, property inspector come in and look at the property and assess um, the, the structure, the, the paintwork, so every, sort of everything, the electrics, everything in the property to ensure that um, you don't have uh, hidden costs coming out when you do take over the property. But the issue, one step further, is that a lot of people rely on the estate agent to know or have known or be a professional in having known that, that there are issues. And again, that's not what the estate agents are trained for. They, it's not their skill set or their expertise. So you don't expect or, or can't expect an estate agent to point out all the issues. So it really is advisable. And it's not a big cost considering you know, the average property in South Africa um, when people are buying is, is between 700,000 to a million rand. So if you're looking at that, that sort of uh, price point, if it's going to cost you three, 4,000 rand to get a property inspector in, to give you a full assessment of a property and potentially give you a report that's going to be, enable you to negotiate a, a cheaper price on the property, it's certainly worth that 4,000 uh, still 4,000 and um, upfront investment to do so. And, 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 you know, one of the things I think I, I like, I, like I mentioned, I, I made this mistake um, and I was a newbie. So I was a newbie buyer, didn't even know about property inspection, to be honest. Um, and when I bought um, my initial sort of two properties, both of them didn't, they weren't inspected. Um, I think in both OTPs, uh, there were a few declarations of, you know, what the owner knew to have been faulty and some of it I had actually seen when I was inspecting the place myself. But of course, there are things that you do not see. Sometimes there might be, um, whether it's a water leak that you can't visibly see um, or whatever issue there was. I mean, with, with myself, there were a few issues which luckily have now been resolved and didn't cost me an arm and a leg. But I think had I been able to get, firstly, had I been able to know about an inspection and know what inspectors do, um, I would have probably opted for it and would have most likely been able to negotiate a better rate for those particular properties. And both of them are already very well priced at bullishly negotiated the price down. But I reckon had I, you know, put in that extra money, gotten in an inspector, um, I would have probably been able to navigate that slightly better. And, and of course, then Grant, there's also the issue of whether or not to use an estate agent. Um, I mean, oftentimes some sellers might want to sell themselves. And if you're a prospective home buyer and you're dealing with directly with the seller, perhaps you might be feeling a bit wary about it or, you know, not sure whether this person is legit, especially as a first time, you know, you wouldn't know how to best assess whether the process that's actually unfolding is what is supposed to unfold, especially if it's a private sale. How can people best, um, you know, solve for that or know, know that actually this seller is still going according to how a house is meant to be sold? Yeah. So, I mean, firstly, estate agents do need to be registered. So my first piece of advice is use a, a registered estate agent, somebody that can show that you their for the fund certificate. Every single estate agency um, needs to be able to show a firm certificate firstly, and then the estate agent themselves need to have a fidelity fund certificate. So that's sort of the first criteria. It's not, um, it, it doesn't give you a definitive answer, but at least they are complying with uh, the act 
um, in the first instance. Part two then is, um, you know, gut feel comes, comes into a lot. So if you're feeling under pressure and unnecessarily under pressure to buy or make an offer, you know, there's no, there's no, the, the buying process in South Africa is not a, not a quick process. It takes you three months to transfer a property. If the estate agent put you under unnecessary pressure, I would then again, take a step back and um, take, take some time. Maybe don't take a call or, or get some advice from a conveyancing attorney and, uh, and then go from, from, from there again and make a decision once you've got some breathing room. So don't be put under pressure by anybody. There's no reason to rush into and buy and just jump at a property. There are millions of properties out there. The one that gets away is not going to be the one that's going to uh, end the world for you. Um, and, and I mentioned conveyancing attorneys. Build a relationship with a very good conveyancing attorney because they, they ultimately are responsible for the entire transfer process and they can give you good advice whether the, um, the office purchase that you're looking at is very good or good enough. Uh, they could perhaps provide you with an office purchase that you can make use of and they can also give you advice on the process even if um, they're not involved in the initial part of the sale. And, and then, Grant, there's also the issue or mistake that, uh, you know, a lot of first home buyers make is not negotiating. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it, you know, f funny, um, uh, I've got a business partner who says, not what you deserve is what you negotiate. And I think that's the best way to put it. Is, um, I love yeah. that. It's not what you yeah. deserve, it's what you negotiate. Okay. Yeah. And um, uh, so, yeah, it's my pleasure, Brad. Um, so, <laughs> the, it's... Uh, it's, it's very important that you do negotiate and everything's negotiable. Um, you know, you need to understand again, uh, you're not under pressure to buy and, uh, or, or the more that you seem you, that you're under pressure to buy, the higher the price is going to go. The less that you're chasing the deal, the, the, the lower you can push the property, uh, the property price. We're also in, in a buyer's market. So, so this is also another realization of where we are in, um, not even because of uh, lockdown, but coming into lockdown, we were in a buyer's market for a long period yeah. of time. We're going into a, into a prolonged buyer's market now. So anybody that's looking to buy, you're going into possibly the best market to buy a property in the last 10, 10 years um, because there's finance available from the bank. They're very keen to lend and they have been for a long, long, long time. There's going to be lots of stock on the, on, on the market. So lots of properties coming on the market uh, for various reasons. People having to move distressed properties from a financial, financial perspective. And um, people are very uncertain in terms of what they need to do for the long term. So there are going to be a few fewer buyers out there looking to buy. So lots of stock, uh, fewer buyers, and good lending criteria means that, that it's a really, really good time to start considering buying. So don't be put under pressure to just jump and, and buy property and take your time and negotiate. Everything's negotiable. Property prices are going to are going to decline slightly over over the, over the next um, medium or over the medium term. So take advantage of that um, of almost the discount sale. Grant, so I mean, I'm sure that people watching at home uh, who are thinking, okay, I'd, I'd like to be able to negotiate. What would be your negotiating tips, right? Because I don't think that's something that comes naturally. Uh, I'm quite bullish in, in, in my negotiations. And typically, I'd kind of have my different facts. I would have been watching that particular property for an extended period of time. Sometimes I even know that it's been on the market for 10, 12 months, so they're struggling to sell it. So I'd come with all these things, right? Yeah. But not everybody knows how to negotiate, especially if you're going to be buying your first home. Uh, I mean, I was saying in one of the other episodes that often a lot of new home buyers don't know that the purchase price that you see advertised, whether you go onto privateproperty.co.za and you click on your um, you know, in a property that you like and it's going for 800,000. Not a lot of people know that you can actually negotiate that down. You know, oftentimes yeah. people think it's like walking into a mall and a pair of jeans are 200 rands. <laughs> There's no negotiating it down. That's the price that you pay. And we're used to that kind of mentality that the price that we see is a price that we pay. So the idea of having to negotiate is fundamentally harder for us. So if you had to give us some negotiation tips, so negotiation 101, what would be some of your top tips for a new home buyer when they're negotiating uh, for their new home? Yeah, so, um, you know, the first thing you said there is that you watch properties, you know your area. So information is, is always the most important part of any negotiation because you can counter any argument with, with real uh, factual information. So understanding the property trends in the area, how long the property has been in the market, uh, the, dis the distress or motivation behind the sale, why, the why they're selling, um, having a, uh, a pre-approved mortgage in, in place so that you, you know you can move quickly. Um, you know, so those are a few of the, the things you can do. 
it, when you're getting down to sitting across the table from somebody, usually just understanding the situation um, more deeply, understanding why they need to move, what their situation is, why they're selling, and how you can align your offer, what their needs are, is, is vitally important. So, for example, in a motivated situation, somebody might need um, funding to, to pay for moving costs or, or something else, and you can build that into your offer to, to perhaps um, assist them so they can afford to, to actually move their physical furniture out of the property. Um, but in terms of offering that help, you then negotiate more on the price. So, you know, you, you're right. The, the reality is, is the price that's um, sitting on private property when you go and find the property on, on the website is it's, it's a make me an offer of, but it doesn't say the offer must be 800,000 or, or a million rand. It's sort of make, I, I would like 800,000. What are you willing to offer me? Um, the other thing is make negotiation again. You know, people are too scared to, uh, or too shy to negotiate. And I mean, for many years, I was very, very shy to, to negotiate on anything. Um, and my wife um, is uh, of Port Portuguese background and, and the Portuguese are very good at uh, negotiating. And they taught me uh, that it's all a game, ultimately. So don't take it too seriously. It, it, is, it is ultimately a game. Don't get too emotionally attached to the property and have all the, all the information at hand when you are negotiating and then understand the other person's situation um, very well and you'll be uh, on a very good um, wicket to negotiate well. And I think another tip that I'd probably share with our viewers at home is, uh, you know, when you ask things like, what's the reason for, for selling? Some, a lot of estate agents tend to give up quite a lot in answering that question. So sometimes kind of hold back in sharing your own reason for wanting a place and that kind of stuff and let the estate agent talk because they let away uh, so much. So some of them will say this is actually a very desperate seller um, and they've been you know, pushing down the price, but they haven't been getting the right price. So you already know that you probably have more room to push down that price a bit further. Um, sometimes they'll say that they're in the middle of a very nasty divorce. So they actually need this transaction to go on very quickly or whatever the situation is. So you're often able to get a bit of insight about the particular property um, when you have that conversation with your estate agents. So it also just goes to building the relationships with the various estate agents that you're going to be talking to and who are going to be helping you um, find your next home. Now, Grant, I'm going to go through some of the comments and questions from our viewers at home. Remember, if you've got any questions for Grant and myself here on the Private Property Podcast, you can uh, ask them down here below and we'll be sure to address them. Uh, we've got a comment here from Michael Van Nieker, who's actually commenting on the issue of negotiating. And he says, if a property is in high demand, there's a lot of negotiation. There's, there isn't a lot of negotiation that's possible. If it's fair value, the seller will accept, which is fair. I think in some, in some instances, the, the sellers and even the estate agent, they know that they've priced it just well. And that's also why as a seller, it's important to listen to the insight from your estate agent when they tell you this is kind of that sweet spot and you'll be able to get that quick sale if you price it at that level um, and then you possibly won't be able to negotiate um, any further. A question from, PT, uh, from Preeti Makulaba is how long do you estimate the buyer's market to last? Um, so how long is a piece of string really? Um, you know the the, the, the buyer's market coming into, into lockdown um, was probably going on for 18 months. You know, there was uh, pressure on the market um, and there has been pressure for, for a period of time. Um, there was a lot of predictions that uh, middle of last year that it would continue for 18 months. So we we're talking end of 2020, it was then going to look, look to turn. Um, nobody could have predicted uh, where we're sitting today, um, all in our homes um, doing these type of calls. But, um, you know, I, I do think that we're looking at a three to five year um, buyer's market, maybe not as aggressive as the initial two to three years, but I do think we're sitting for a, a, a long-term effect. What it really relies on is how long did lockdown um, last for and how does that affect our economy? We've seen a lot of commentary on that, um, but nobody, you know, no matter what commentary you see out there, no one really knows what, it, what the ultimate effect on our economy is going to be and therefore um, how that's going to affect the property market. Which is very true. And another question coming in, Grant, is from uh, Yasmat Sony, who's asking, are bank sales negotiable? So bank sales are, are negotiable. So it, it generally depends which stage they're sitting at. If um, the uh, homeowner has approached the bank and said, look, I'm in financial trouble at the moment, please, please assist. Then they go into the bank assist program. That is negotiable because it's negotiable directly with the owner. Um, 
you know, once you get into a repossessed pos uh, position where the banks own the property, then you're looking at a, a general auction. So, and the banks will also negotiate on those prices because they generally don't want to sit with that stock on their books. They, they're not, they don't want to own property. They, they don't want the, the properties there. So they're slightly negotiable. Again, they look at their costing and their profit and loss on those properties. So bank sales are negotiable. Um, you just need to build those relationships with the, with the relative uh, banks or the estate agents who deal with bank stock. And similar to, to that question, Grant, uh, but this one is from Setu Shabalala. She's asking, can you negotiate with developers and should you try? Huh. So, and that's a um, good one because I mean, we've no, seen a lot yeah, of developers coming up and their prospectors will have a set price. Is that a price that's actually negotiable for us? Yes, yeah, so, so generally the um, developments have been in the past not, not that negotiable um, unless you were looking to buy bulk. So you were looking to buy 10, 15, 20 units at a time. Um, I do think that you might find now leading into the, the coming market now, especially the guys who started building six, eight, or six, eight months ago where they're coming to the end of a the development, they're going to be sitting with stock. Now, it depends on their position and their balance sheet and their, their bank balances, whether they're going to be able to hold on to that stock or they're going to have to release it. So I do think we're going to get it coming to a stage which is going to be uh, unusual um, that developers probably will be slightly more negotiable than they have been in the past. And it's going to be interesting because I think we're already seeing the market being heavily um, loaded with quite a lot of properties from developers and, and a lot of them struggling to sell. And often some of them would, um, for example, offer a year's rates off in order to entice buyers to actually buy. And the moment you're seeing you know, offers like that, you already know that they're probably struggling to sell a certain phase. Um, and so if we were already going into sort of lockdown or the COVID era with a lot of developers having built or um, thinking they were going to build the next few phases. And now we're going through this, perhaps as buyers, this is that right time to kind of say, you know, you had 800,000, for example, for a one bed, let's see if we can actually negotiate. Because if anything, this is probably the time where even they are more negotiable um, because there might very likely not be as many buyers, even though it's a buyer's market, there might be quite a lot of people who are very negatively impacted by um, where we can already see the state of the economy is going. So I think if you're a buyer who will not be as heavily affected, this is probably the time to take your chance with the various developers. Um, and they're, very, they're more likely than not, I think, in this era, or as we kind of move as the months go on, to be negotiable on their particular price. Um, and of course, if you've just joined us, you are tuned in. So just on, on, on that point, oh, sorry. So on no, that, on that, you can continue. Uh, yeah, on that point quickly, um, just people need to understand the, the, the biggest expense in terms of owning a property is actually the holding costs. Those developers have taken, have got financing and holding costs and rates and taxes. It's really expensive for them to sit on stock and just wait for somebody to buy. So if, if they're struggling to buy and you come along and you're willing and able to buy and you're in a position to buy, you're certainly going to be at the top of their list. And, and I'm sure now going forward, like you said, is um, there's going to be a lot of stock there. So they'll be more negotiable on their pricing. So the holding costs, once you start seeing a property sitting empty for a period of time, those holding costs are really expensive. And the most, that's the most expensive thing in property is, is an empty property. So um, yeah, you, you go after those. And that's very true. Uh, Grant, we've got another question here from uh, Jacob Mangena, who's, who asks, how, how do I turn a PTO into a title deed and the procedure to be followed and the costs involved? A PTO into a title deed. So, mm -hmm. so I, I think the, the best thing to do is you approach a conveyancing attorney. The conveyancing attorneys need to take care of any conversions. Um, you know, they deal with the, the transfers and the title deeds and, and the um, deeds office themselves. So you need to find a, a good conveyancing attorney. Now, there are several really good conveyancing attorneys out there. Um, you just need to find somebody who understands the process. Be careful when you are selecting an attorney. You don't want to go to a, uh, for example, a, I don't know, a labor law firm who might have a conveyance that's sitting in the back corner. You want to go to a pure property property law yeah. firm. And I know you had um, Silna Stain on recently, um, SSLR. Um, so I would approach a, a company like SSLR Inc. and uh, uh, approach their um, uh, Pateka, their conveyancer, and have her, have a look at it. Okay, um, as, as you know, we're slowly about to wrap up our conversation, Grant, um, but before we do, I think another, another you know, mistake people 
or new home buyers potentially make, especially when you're buying your, your first home. I know the strategy when you now go into you know, property investment and buying investment properties tends to be slightly different. And that's of course not saving for a deposit, right? I mean, this probably should have been one of the first few that we, we covered, but people don't save for a deposit. If we can just look at, you know, what are some of the reasons why people should even consider um, saving for a deposit, especially given how banks are now giving out, you know, 100%, sometimes more home loans. Yes, I mean, the, the reality is, is if you actually look at the cost of a mortgage over a 20 year period, um, it is actually very, very expensive. So if you, for every 100,000 rand that you put down or 50,000 or 10,000 rand that you put down towards your property up front, it's going to save you a huge amount over 20 years. So, so, I mean, it's one of the biggest reasons and, and, you know, it doesn't take long for you to just calculate on a, on a, on a million rand bond, how much that's going to cost you um, over a 20 period. So first it's the long-term savings um, that, it, that it does for you. And secondly is the short-term cash flow. So therefore, again, if you put down a 20% deposit, that means on a monthly basis, you are paying 20% less than you would have otherwise been. That puts less pressure on you. And, and, you know, I think um, what uh, this lockdown period and, and the effect of the economy is really going to show is people that have overexposed themselves bought and like you said earlier bought properties that they really were on the edge of being able to afford now in a situation where they, their employers are reducing their incomes um, or, or sending them on unpaid leave or in fact they're losing their jobs this is really going to um, sort of show you show a lot of people up for their, their exposure to their um, highly leveraged assets so you really do want to um, not only save for deposit actually but first you save for deposits to minimize the cost over a long period of time but part two is you want to be saving or you need to be saving for the potential transfer duty and transfer costs. So those are two costs that are, are often um, forgotten about when you're a first time buyer is this transfer duty, which is the tax on the property over 900,000 Rand that you purchase. And second, second, uh, second portion is, is the, sorry, it's a million Rand. Um, and the second portion is um, the uh, transfer, uh, transfer cost, which is paid to the conveyancing attorney as the buyer when they're transferring the property into your name. So you need to save for deposits as well as those transfer costs and transfer duties. And that's actually also one of the mistakes I made when I bought. Um, I didn't realize that when you're buying a bonded property, so when you're using a home loan to buy as opposed to buying as a cash buyer, there are actually two sets of attorneys that you use. And, and I hadn't factored in the bond registration attorney. And it's because at the time I simply just did not know. Um, and I remember at the time I was buying two properties at a go and I had two, you know, attorneys sending me their invoice. So I was aware of them. And then all of a sudden I had a third attorney sending me an invoice and I thought, wait, what's this invoice for? And then a fourth invoice coming in. And for a moment, I actually thought I was being scammed because they had all my details in this invoice and I had to call them up and they, and you know, the nice thing is they were quite sweet, you know, explaining that, no, so this is your first property uh, because you're uh, buying it via a bond. There's going to be the transferring attorneys. So those guys are your transferring attorneys. We are the bond registration attorneys, and this is what we do. And, you know, luckily I had some reserves that I could tap into to buy, to pay for those, you know, for the extra attorneys. But if you don't budget for it, you very likely won't be able to pay for them. And I mean, those two properties were both very good properties, a really good deal. And I'm just really fortunate that I didn't, for example, have to then go take a home loan to be paying for, I mean, go take a personal loan to be paying for, um, conveyance of costs because that's also something you don't want to have to do you don't want to have to take out a personal loan uh whether it's for the deposit or for the conveyance of costs because the interest rates on that are actually so high grant yeah. before i let you go any other last tips that you have for our viewers at home who are looking into buying their first home and don't want to make any mistake uh, that could cost them money down the line no, I think, um, you know, uh, again, I think I started with it is don't get too emotional about it. Don't rush into a property. Um, you know, it, it's for the long term. And, and I really do think that people that are first time buyers need to consider their first home actually as a first investment property, despite the fact that they live there for a period of time. That's going to be your future investment and move on from there. So don't get emotional and take the time and buy. Grant, thank you so much for joining me. That's Grant Smear, the director at Epic South Africa. And this was episode eight of the Private Property Podcast. I've been your host, Zamantunga Kumal. Of course, remember, if you want to, uh, or rather, if you have any buying, selling, or rental needs, you can go onto our website on www.privateproperty.co.za. Until tomorrow, have a great evening. Stay home and stay safe. Goodbye.